Hello, boys and girls. Welcome back for a new read aloud video this week. We have um, an exciting biography that we're going to talk about. And actually, at the end of the video, we're going to get to do a really fun hands on activity that you can do at home if you have the ingredients in your kitchen. So just keep on watching. And when we get to that point, I will let you know so that you can grab your materials to do that. So, first, we're going to review our target vocabulary like we do every single week that we'll see in, in our story. The first one is exact. The map showed the exact place to dig for old bones. So an exact means right there. There's, it's very correct. There's no relative space. It's exactly where I put it. I know exactly where it is. Number two is discovered. This old shark's tooth was discovered on a beach. It was found by a scientist. So if you discover something, that is just another word for found. I discovered a new recipe. I discovered a new playground in our neighborhood. You discovered something. You found something. Number three is remove. This scientist uses a brush to gently remove or take away sand. So remove just means to take away. You can remove the dog out of your yard. You can remove writing with your eraser. So remove just means to take away. Number four is growled. The dog growled and barked as it dug up the old bone. So sometimes if a dog is growling, that probably means, means you need to stay away because it's starting to show its teeth and it might mean that it's a little bit angry or frustrated. Number five is amazed. The girl was amazed at the size of the dinosaur teeth in the museum. So if you're amazed by something, that might mean that you're in awe. I can't believe it. That was amazing. That means that you were amazed. Number six is explained. The man explained or told about the dinosaur. So if I'm explaining something to you, that means I'm telling you something. I'm teaching you about something and I'm going into detail. So you might explain how to solve the math problem. Number seven is guard. A guard makes sure no one touches anything in the museum. So a guard might be a security guard to make sure that somebody doesn't rob a bank or there could be a bodyguard who protects really important people like the president or someone that's famous. And finally, souvenirs. He bought souvenirs to remember his day at the museum. So souvenirs are like little toys or t-shirts or stickers or anything like that that is from a specific place so that you can take it home with you to show that you've been there once before. So a lot of places will have souvenirs with the place's name on it and you can take it home and show other people and say, hey, I brought back a souvenir. And it might be like a little keychain with that particular place that you went on. It'll have that information on there. So as before, you know, we like to look at our target vocabulary and we like to kind of predict what the story might be about. So when I was looking at our vocabulary words, I noticed that a lot of our example sentences had to do with dinosaurs and bones and museums. So I wonder what our story is going to be about. Can you think about what our story might be about? Maybe it will be about bones and museums or things that you find in a museum. I don't know. We will have to figure it out. So just like every story, we have our target skill. In this particular story, it is fact and opinion. And if you remember working with facts and opinion, you know that a fact is something that can be proved to be true or false. So you know that that fact might come from the internet or from a book or something along those lines, but you know that is true. You can tell somebody and say, no, this is a fact. I know that that's correct. So a fact might be an elephant has a really long trunk. That's true. Every time you see an elephant, he has a long trunk and that helps him eat and drink and take a bath and all that good stuff. So that is a fact. That is true. On the other hand, you have an opinion. So an opinion is just what somebody believes or what they feel. It doesn't mean that it's true. It doesn't mean that it's right. It's their opinion. So if a fact is that an elephant has a trunk, an opinion about an elephant might be I think elephants are the coolest animal in the whole world. 
Well, somebody else might think that a tiger is the coolest animal or a shark is the coolest animal. So just because I believe it or I feel that elephants are the coolest animals doesn't make it true. So it's an opinion. And something that we always talk about is when you have an opinion, a lot of times you hear those key words like I think or I feel because it's how you're feeling. It's what you're thinking. It's not what everybody's thinking. It is not a fact. It is just an opinion. So after we read through this story, an extra um, activity that you can do at home would be to go back and listen to the story again and create a T-chart like they have in the book. And you can actually find facts and opinions that the author has stated in our story. Today, we're not going to have time to do that because I have a fun craft at the end, but I wanted to give you that opportunity for working on your target skill and practicing your writing. So before we read our story, I'm going to preview the topic. And it says, sometimes parts of animals or plants that lived long ago can be found today. These are called fossils. An animal bone is an example of a fossil. Fossils can be found all over the world. Scientists look for fossils to help them learn about the past. Some fossils are on display at museums. So we're about to read a story about a girl and her dog who discovered some fossils in the dog that dug for dinosaurs. And before we start talking, um, dinosaurs, you know, those are animals that lived a long time ago. We don't see them anymore because they are extinct. They've all died out, but we know a lot of information about them. And that is because scientists and historians have found their fossils. And so fossils are either their footprints or their bones or parts of their body that have been smushed in between Earth's elements, whether it's tree sap or amber or rocks or caves or anything like that. And it has actually created kind of like an imprint of what they looked like. And so when we find fossils, it gives us lots of information like where they've lived, what food they ate, you know, how big they are, how long ago were they alive if they're not alive today. So Fossils are very, very important. It gives us a lot of information. And so I think that's why the author wrote this story, The Dog That Dug for Dinosaurs. It's by Shirley Ray Redmond and illustrated by Stacy Schwett. Um, and so these two women decided to write a biography. And remember, a genre tells us a lot of information about our story. A biography tells events in a person's life. So I'm wondering if maybe this little girl and maybe the dog, maybe the story's about something important that they did, something that they found, and the author decided that it was important enough to write about. So today, that's what we're going to read about. We're gonna read about a girl and a dog. Um, and as always, we like to look at our essential question at the bottom that says, how can you learn about animals that lived long ago? So our essential question wants us to know how we can learn more about animals. And I think this story will probably give us some more information about that. So we're going to read together. Remember, as Miss Owen reads, you can always speed it up, slow it down, mute me, and come back to practice your fluency. Um, so we're going to dive in and do our activity at the end. A long, long time ago, there was a little dog named Trey. He was black and white all over. He had friendly brown eyes and a very wiggly tail. Trey lived in England. Trey was a real dog, and this is an honestly true story about him. Trey loved two things most in the whole world. First, he loved Mary Anning. She was 12 years old and lived with her family in a small cottage near the beach in, in Lyme Regis. Secondly, Trey loved going with Mary to dig for fossils. So who is this story about? What is this biography of? Who is this story about? Mary and Trey. So it's about the girl Mary and her little dog Trey. And what did they like to do? They like to dig for fossils. So what are fossils anyway? They are the remains of animals and plants that died a long time ago. When a leaf or bone gets pressed between layers of sea mud, it leaves an imprint. After many, many years, the mud hardens to rock. Okay, so 
why do you think that the author showed us a real picture of a fossil? Why do you think the author wanted to include a real picture when all the other illustrations are paintings? I think the author showed us a picture of this fossil because she wanted to she wanted to show us what it looks like, what a real fossil looks like, and so that we have a better understanding of what Mary and Trey are actually looking for. And so our author explained to us what happens when a fossil's created. So how did this shell, how did this fossil get created? So the shell got pressed between the sand and the mud. And after a really, really long time, that mud got really hard and turned to rock. And it left the imprint or the pattern of the shell that was behind. And I think that's pretty cool. Trey and Mary knew that they would find the very best fossils high up on the cliffs around the beach. They climbed up there every day. Trey sniffed the rocks. Sniff, sniff. He pawed the dirt. Scratch, scratch. Mary used a small ham hammer and chisel. Tap, tap, tap. With these tools, Mary carefully cut fossils out of the cliff, just as her father had shown her. Trey watched as she placed the fossils in her basket. Most of them looked like she seashells. Mary and Trey sold them as souvenirs to the tourists that came by stagecoach to swim at the beach near their home. Okay, so it looks like Mary and Trey are digging up some fossils and the author said that most of them look like seashells. Why do you think most of their fossils looked like seashells? because they live next to the beach and people from all over would come to visit their beach and all the big rocks around it. And so Mary and Trey would sell them as souvenirs. So maybe they would just sell, sell the little fossils or turn them into keychains or something like that. And then people would pay money to purchase them. One day, Trey and Mary discovered some very large bones sticking out of the rocks. They were huge. Trey growled and tried to dig the bones out. Mary used her hands to brush away the loose dirt. Trey, we've discovered a monster, she declared. The bones were much too big for Trey and Mary to remove by themselves. I'll go for help, Mary said. You stay here, Trey. Trey barked loudly and sat down in front of the bones. He was a very good guard dog. Okay, so what kind of tools does Mary use to dig up fossils? What kind of tools did she need to get the fossils out of the rock? So remember, if you're looking for evidence in your text, it's good to go back and read. Um, so I remember reading around here about tools and it was saying that Mary used a hammer and a chisel so that she could hit them together and it would break apart the pieces of rock so that she could scoop them out with her hands. But the fossil and the bones that they just found in the rock were way too big. So Mary has to go and get some help. Mary ran all the way back down to town and asked some grown-ups to help her. Trey and I have found something really special in the cliff, she told them. Just wait and see. When the men saw the giant rib bones in the side of the cliff, they were amazed. What a beast, they cried. Look at those sharp teeth. Is it a crocodile? One man asked. Or a stubby whale? We don't know what it is, Mary admitted but we know it's something special, don't we, Trey? Trey yipped and wagged his tail. So looking at the illustration in the story, what does this big fossil look like to you? It looks like a dinosaur to me, but if Mary had to go ask the adults for help and they're all scratching their head and they're looking and they're amazed and they're asking questions like, is that a crocodile? Oh my goodness, that's huge. Do you think they really know what that fossil is? 
Probably not. I think that they're guessing right now, probably because they've never seen something like that before. A rich man who lived nearby heard about the sea monster. He hurried to see it for himself. I'll buy it, he cried. I'll give it to the British Museum in London. Do you know what it is? Mary asked. It is called an ichthyosaur, the man told her. That means fish lizard, he explained. It's like a dinosaur with fins. So if you look in your text right here, I see a really tricky word that's long and it may not follow the rules of spelling and reading like we're used to. So the author helps us out and right here she's putting her pronunciation. So sometimes this is really helpful if we're not really sure and you just need to break it down into like syllables. It's almost like she's put them into syllables. Ick, the a sore and then put them together ichthyosaur so when you're reading it it doesn't look like that but the author really helped us out and put that pronunciation right there so we have ichthyosaur and that means a fish lizard so the rich man knows that it's a dinosaur um, and it's a special kind of dinosaur that he's familiar with okay so um why, like, what do you think Mary feels about this fossil? Do you think she likes it? I think she does too. Remember, because she thinks that they found something special. That's her opinion. So I wonder what other people are going to think about this fossil. The amazing news spread about the gigantic fish lizard and the dog and the little girl who had found it. Soon, many strangers came to Lyme Regis where Mary and Trey lived. They all wanted to hunt for fossils too. The men wore tall top hats. The women wore frilly bonnets. They carried pretty umbrellas called parasols. Mary shook her head and smiled. She rubbed Trey's soft ears. They watched the strangers together. They don't have the right tools, Mary whispered, and they're wearing the wrong kind of shoes. Aren't they silly, Trey? Trey yipped and chased his tail. So why are all of these people who don't live in Lyme Regis, why are they going there? They wanted to figure out the fossils, the news spread about these fossils that they found in Lyme Regis. And remember, this story was taking place a long, long time ago. So I wonder how they got the word out because they didn't have cell phones. They didn't have computers back then. So I wonder if maybe somebody wrote a letter or they posted an article in the newspaper. And maybe that's how people found out that Lyme Regis had these new fossils. So if you look at the way that Mary described the other characters um, and what they're wearing and how they're dressed, do you think that these clothes are good for digging up bones and getting all dirty? Probably not. I think that's why that she and Trey are kind of making fun of them a little bit because they look like they don't belong. Curious scientists visited Lyme Regis too. One man came from the university in Oxford. His name was William Buckland. He went to the old carpenter's shop where Mary and Trey sold their fossils. Can you show me where you found your ichthyosaur, young lady? He asked politely. Do you think you could find the exact spot again? Trey could find it, Mary boasted. So why do you think that William Buckland wants to go to the exact spot where they found that fossil? probably because they want to learn more information about it. He, maybe he's a scientist or maybe a, an historian that wants to figure out more information about this fish lizard. Together, Mary and Mr. Buckland followed the little dog across the beach and up to the cliffs. Trey sniffed the rocks, sniff, sniff. He pawed the dirt, scratch, scratch. Suddenly, he yipped. Then he sat down. Mary pointed. It was the exact place where she had discovered the strange fish lizard. What an intelligent dog, Mr. Buckland declared. Trey wagged his tail. So why did Mr. Buckland say that Trey was intelligent or smart? Why does he think that dog is super smart? 
because he found the exact spot of the dinosaur. And that must be pretty tricky to do on a big beach like that, where there's tons of rocks that look the same. So it's pretty cool that Trey was able to find the exact spot where they found that ichthyosaur. Trey and Mary continued to dig for fossils. They were very careful. Mary watched for falling rocks like her dad told her. Trey looked out for storms and high tides. Then one day they discovered another giant creature. Look, Trey, Mary cried. Is it a sea dragon? Trey sniffed the skeleton and snapped at it with his teeth. The creature had a long, long neck. Its backbone was like a humped turtle shell. Instead of feet and legs, it had four large paddles. But it wasn't a sea dragon. Mr. Buckland called it a plesiosaur. Okay, so how do they stay safe when they're around all these big rocks? What does Mary do? Mary watches for falling rock and Trey makes sure that he that the weather's nice and that the water isn't going to come splash on top of them. So he's checking out the tide. So they found another dinosaur, but is this dinosaur the same as the other one that they found? No. So if you watched um, my science video from last week where we did a Venn diagram comparing characteristics, maybe as a bonus activity, you could compare the different dinosaurs that Mary and Trey found in this story. That'd be pretty cool. And something I've noticed a lot is that they keep saying that it's some kind of like lizard. It looks kind of like a lizard. So I wonder if maybe dinosaurs passed on some traits um, to lizards and alligators and things. One day, Trey and Mary found a fossil that no one in England had ever found before. This one had huge bony wings like a bat and a long, sharp jaw. Trey growled. It looks like a gigantic flying lizard, Mary declared. The scientists thought so too, and that's why they named it pterodactyl. That means lizard with wings. Over the years, Trey, Mary, and Mr. Buckland became good friends. They showed him where to find their best fossils in Lyme Regis. So a pterodactyl is a really popular dinosaur that people still talk about today and they found it so mary and trey were the people that found that pterodactyl and that's what we still talk about to this day so that's pretty cool mr buckland brought books about dinosaurs for mary he brought beef bones for trey mary with trey on her lap studied her books every day when Trey's whiskers turned gray and Mary was all grown up, they still collected fossils and sold them in the old carpenter shop. There were boxes and baskets filled with fossils on the floor and on the shelves. Some of the fossil creatures were so big they couldn't fit through the door. Sometimes children and tourists stopped in to buy fossils of ancient sand dollars or tiny fish and curly shells. Many scientists came to the shop to buy fossils too. They brought carts and wagons to haul away the really large ones. So they must have continued finding fossils even after they found those first few um, dinosaur ones, boys and girls. And I wonder why Mr. Buckland kept buying Mary books about dinosaurs. I wonder why he would do that. I wonder if maybe he thought she was interested and could become um, a scientist that studied fossils in the future. Who knows? Trey and Mary Anning became very famous. Today, if you go to the Natural History Museum in London, you can see the large fossils they discovered together. You can also see a famous painting of Mary holding her fossil basket and Trey, the dog that dug for dinosaurs. So remember, if you are famous, that means a lot of people are, know you or you did something special and so people want to remember you. So it looks like somebody painted a picture and they have some of the fossils that they found in the Natural History Museum in London. So if you flew all the way over there to the other continent, England, and you went and saw those fossils, 
that's because of Mary and Trey. And so the author wanted to write that story because we still talk about fossils to this day. And so that's very important. So to me, those are very important people. I think that they, the author wanted us to know that because they discovered something that we still talk about to this day. And dinosaurs are super, super cool. And because we finished our story, I wanted us to do something fun that you could do at home. And that is to make your own fossils. So if you've ever been to a museum, whether it's the Children's Museum in Memphis or somewhere else, you can look and see that they have fossils on display. And remember, fossils are like hard rocks that have imprints where something is smushed. So it could be a leaf, it could be a bone, it could be anything. But today we're going to take some materials that you probably already have in your kitchen and we're going to make some our own fossils out of anything that you want in your house. So today I picked two things that we could do. So before we start, I'm going to move this over and get my ingredients. So I can give you the recipe for you to make fossils. Remember, when we do these activities, make sure that you ask your parents that it's okay before you grab everything and use everything up or if you use any kind of heat because in this recipe, we do have to use the oven at the end. So make sure that you ask your parents that it's okay and that you don't do it by yourself, okay? So your ingredients for this recipe is you need two cups of flour. So here's my regular white flour. You need two cups of flour. You need one cup of salt. So two cups of flour, one cup of salt, and half of a cup of warm water. I have my water in here. It's just a little bit, but it needs to be warm. You don't want it to be cold. You also need some parchment paper and a pan. I'm just gonna use a paper plate to set them on because I'm not gonna make a lot of fossils. I'm just gonna make a couple. <clears throat> you need a spoon and a bowl. So once you have all of your ingredients, we're going to make our recipe and then we're going to make our fossil imprints. Now you can pick anything you want in your house. If you have some dinosaur toys that have like bony necks or something like that, that would be super cool. I don't have any toys like that at my house. So I tried to find something that had some raised edges so that I could make it myself. So I borrowed my nephew's little toy car because it has wheels and I'm wondering if, if it will leave tire marks on it or not. We'll have to see. And then I also just picked a leaf from outside because on the back side it has some veins and I'm wondering if I can make a fossil out of this leaf. So I'm going to do this really quick because my computer's about to die. But what you're going to do is you're going to pour in your flour into your bowl. And then you're going to pour in your salt. Just mix them all together. And then you're going to pour in your warm water. Okay, and it's going to make kind of like a thick dough, almost like a Play-Doh. So you're going to mix it together. Whoop, making a mess over here. And if it's a little bit too um, dry, remember you can always add more water. If it's a little bit too wet, then you can add some more flour or some more salt. So this is something that we call salt dough. And you can make a lot of imprints with salt dough um, in your oven. We're just gonna make a small batch and hope that it works. I may not have enough water, but I'm gonna try to mix it as best as I can. Okay, so mine might not have enough water, but I ran out and I don't have any more water outside. So, I'm just gonna do the best that I can, but it should be kind of like a Play-Doh, maybe a little bit more fluffier than a Play-Doh. So I'm move this out of the way. I'm gonna get my little paper plate with parchment paper on it. I'm gonna take some of this dough and squish it into a ball. So it should make like four large fossils or two small ones. I'm gonna make it into a ball and roll it in my hands. Try to get it as packed as I can. Kind of roll it into a ball. I'm gonna flatten it. I'm gonna squish it with my palm like this. Okay, I'm gonna grab one more since I only have two toys. I have a car and I have a leaf. So those are the two things that I'm gonna try to make my fossil on. 
got to go quick though because my computer is going to die, boys and girls. That would be so sad if you didn't get to see my fossil. Okay, I'm going to roll it into a ball, squeeze it, and flatten it. If you have a cookie sheet, you can do tons of fossils, but I'm just going to do two. So remember, a fossil can be any kind of track or imprint. So I'm going to try the car first and see what happens. <clears throat> I'm gonna take my car, I'm gonna roll the tires across and see if it leaves any tracks. Okay, so you can see where it left a little bit of a track on this side, that one's a little bit harder to see. <clears throat> and next I'm gonna use my leaf. I'm not gonna use the flat side, I'm gonna use the side that has all these raised edges. I'm gonna lay it like this. I'm going to try to press it into my salt dough. Press it. And see if I peel it up, if it leaves an imprint. Let's hope. Oh, it did. It's kind of hard to see. But look, it leaves the imprint of the leaf. Okay, so once you have a ton of these or you just want to do a couple, you want to lay them on a baking sheet. Don't put a paper plate in the oven. If you've got your parents' permission, turn the oven to 250 degrees and you're going to put your fossils in the oven for one to two hours until they get hard like a rock and then you will have your very own fossil. So boys and girls, if you make your own fossils with any kind of toys or leaves or flowers that you have laying around your house, please tag White Station on Facebook so that we can see your great artwork during this virtual learning time. As always, we miss you. We hope that you're staying safe and I will see you next week for a new read aloud. Bye everybody.